Uh, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. We prepared an evening, a wonderful evening tonight, where you'll get to hear unique perspectives from a family member of survivors from the Armenian Genocide and survivors of the Holocaust and Rwandan, Cambodian, and Bosnian genocides. I want to briefly express to you how much it means to me personally that you all came out tonight to show your support for genocide awareness. I'm fortunate enough to have grandparents and great aunts who are Holocaust survivors. However, I'm forced to also recall all of my family who did not survive. And I know I'm not alone. If it's not you whose family suffered from genocide, I'm sure you can think of a friend or a friend of a friend who is in that position. My grandfather often says that he should not be able to say that the rest of my family should not be alive because he should not be alive. Sadly, he can say this. The Cummings challenges are pushed to make sure no one can ever say that again. With that, I would like to thank William and Joyce Cummings for inspiring us to bring you many wonderful events and speakers like tonight, and hopefully more for the rest of the semester, and to Tufts Hillel for making it possible. People have said time and time again, never again, yet genocide keeps happening again and again across different cultures. We, as students, want to take a stand at making never again a reality. Although each survivor's talk is just a snapshot into their ex whole experience, I really hope you enjoy learning from the amazing speakers we have for you tonight. Thank you, and now I would like to introduce Rabbi Jeffrey Summit, Executive Director of Hillel. Thank you, Sophie. It's really important that we're here this evening um, and I so appreciate um, our speakers for being with us tonight. I'll introduce them briefly, and you have f uh, fuller biographies of them on the, uh, on the handouts that were made. When Joyce and Bill Cummings, uh, Bill is a trustee emeritus of Tufts, um, went, uh, and a committed Roman Catholic, um, went to the Holocaust Museum in, uh, in Israel at Yad Vashem um, and came back saying that we have to educate on this broader issue. We talked at length about what it means to create programs that sandpaper the awareness of our students on campus, sandpaper people's awareness so this generation could be exquisitely aware of what it means when s prejudice and hatred and uh, stereotyping arise in a society and we could rise up and say no to it at the earliest times. There will be times in each one of your lives, in my life, when we'll need to stand up and raise a moral voice. And we hope that programs like this will um, sensitize us to the importance of being early warning systems in, in society. Um, I think our program tonight is quite extraordinary. Um, it's very different from other um, Holocaust and genocide awareness programs that we've done in the past, where we have one survivor share her or his experience in depth. Here we asked an uh, extraordinary group of survivors um, from five uh, contemporary genocides uh, to be with us, and uh, I already, we already apologize for them that they're speaking briefly. Each one will speak for 10, 12 minutes, uh, although there'll be time afterwards for uh, questions and answers. But through their stories, we hope to show some of the continuity of themes and the ways that universal uh, issues of hatred and prejudice have come together to shape genocides um, in our own lifetimes, the lifetimes of uh, our parents and the lifetimes of our grandparents. So um, first, I'm going to just uh, speak b very briefly about each one of our uh, um, speakers. So Hachik uh, Muradian is the grandson of Armenian uh, genocide survivors. He's the editor of the Armenian Weekly and a PhD student in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. His dissertation focuses on the destruction of the Armenians in the Syrian desert during the Armenian Genocide. Our next speaker, Maurice Reis Vanderpol, was born in Amsterdam in 1922 to a middle-class Jewish family. 
By 1942, when deportations were going at full speed, um, Maurice and his family decided to go into hiding with the help of Gentile friends. He was hiding for about two years until the liberation on May 5th, 1945. Our next speaker after that, Sayon Siun, was born in the Tikio province in Cambodia in the late 1970s. He was trained to be a child soldier until about 1979. Currently, Mr. Sion resides in Lowell, and he became, he's uh, become the executive director of Light of Cambodian Children um, and uh, a former member of the uh, Massachusetts Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee. After that, Yasmina Chesich, um, is a survivor of the, um, of the Bosnian genocide. Um, now uh, she has a degree in business administration and uh, uh, works in Cambridge. Um, she is an author and a prominent speaker on these areas. She's the author of the book, um, The River Runs uh, Salt Runs Sweet. Um, and then finally, um, Eugenie Mukashimiana, is, uh, was a young adult and eight months pregnant when genocide broke out in her native country of Rwanda in 1994. In 2010, Eugenie founded Genocide Survivors Support Network and to help survivors living in the United States. Um, before they speak, just please could you welcome our speakers today. We're going to invite each one of our speakers to either speak from where they are or stand up. And Hachik, let me uh, um, invite you to begin. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure you realize uh, that you are in the presence of individuals, of extraordinary individuals who have experienced and who have been through some of the greatest atrocities and calamities in human history. When I was asked to speak here, I was faced with a dilemma. I'm not a genocide survivor. Uh, otherwise, I would be a very young-looking Armenian genocide survivor. Uh, I'm not a genocide survivor, yet in more ways than one, the Armenian genocide and genocide and human rights violations in general have shaped my life, have informed my work, and continue to do so to this day. For me, uh, you know, imagine two generations from now when there's going to be a situation where we would not have that many Holocaust survivors that many survivors even of the Rwandan genocide. Imagine two generations from now, young, you know, second generation, third generation, fourth generation survivors uh, uh, standing up in a, at a university like this and talking about the experience of their grandparents. Imagine on the other hand, if this continuity did not exist. Imagine if there was no continuity and there was the memory of victims of genocide and the memory of survivors was just cut off. What I'm trying to say is, is that in, ma in, in many ways, genocides are part uh, of our reality and unfortunately are going to be so for generations and generations to come. And if we fail to see that connection, if you fail to see that connection that starts from the genocide survivor and then goes d down to his or her uh, children, grandchildren, neighbors, friends, and families, and spreads to touch the lives of each and every one of us, if we fail to see that connection, the chances of other genocides taking place are, are going to continue, uh, are going to be there 
and uh, again and again. I have this very vivid memory of uh, growing up in Lebanon, where I was born, surrounded by survivors of the Armenian Genocide. We used to go to attend genocide commemoration events on April 24th, the commemoration day for the Armenian Genocide. And I have this memory of these survivors sitting on the front rows. This was in the early 80s. Uh, and then as the years passed, the number of those survivors dwindled e each by each passing year. And today, it's very difficult across commu Armenian communities across the world, whenever we're having genocide commemorations, to actually see survivors sitting on the front rows. Which is where people like myself come in. It, it is important to actually convey the message of genocide and the horrors of genocide because there is no other way of uh, dealing with this. Genocide, the Holocaust, genocide in general, are not some kind of evil that descend from, from the sky or some other place. They're part and parcel of human experience. And which is why they can impact and touch every one of us, regardless of what, what kind of environment we're living in, where we're living in. So which, which brings, you know, it, it really brings the issue of, uh, of the importance of facing the past, the importance of struggling against genocide today, fighting against genocide today, to our door fronts. A few years ago, I, had, uh, I was speaking uh, somewhere in Massachusetts, and I was introduced to a genocide survivor, an Armenian genocide survivor. And you know, the, the burden of a genocide survivor is that not only do they have to have their experience and, and have to constantly live with the memories of what they witnessed, but also, every single time they are approached and somebody tell, says, you know, she's a genocide survivor, or he's a genocide survivor, they are asked to tell their stories. And, and imagine the, the, uh, these individuals who, you know, like, just like that, have to turn on that experience and start talking about it. It can happen any time, in any place. Tell me what happened to you, that, that question. And this is what happened with this Armenian genocide survivor. You know, the people around her immediately said, why don't you tell him what happened to you? I don't remember the particularities of her experience. In many ways, each genocide survivor has a unique story, but also in many ways, their experiences are very similar. But what was in, uh, unique in particular to that survivor was that she would start talking and then she would s laugh and then she would pause continue her story, and then laugh again. And then again, stop, continue her story, and laugh. And in the end, she apologized and she told me, you know what, I have cried so much that I have no tears anymore. It is moments like this that you realize that time doesn't matter. Space doesn't matter. It is important for us to see that this, this connection between survivors of different generations, of different times, of different locations, from the Holocaust to Rwanda, to Eastern Europe, uh, Cambodia. And this is, this is the actual message. And then, you know, when I'm talking, when I'm speaking with uh, university students, when I'm speaking with uh, high school students, it is, it is very important to me to make the point that fighting against genocide, struggling against genocide and mass human, human rights violations is the job and duty and responsibility of all of us. And it's, it's, it's very easy to say, you know what, this is not the time for me to do this. You know, there are people dealing with this. I'm not equipped with the means. I'm not equipped with the resources. There's going to be time to do that. And believe me, there's, people can say that again and again for the rest of their lives. There's always a better time to do something good and to stand up against uh, human rights violations. But also, there's never a better time to stand up against human rights violations than the here and now. And it's, it's, it's very easy to, see, to think about these 
activists and, and, and heroes who actually are doing that day in, day out, some of whom are on this panel tonight. But, but remember that many of us, and, and they too, were actually one day in the past students just like you, students just like me. So it's, there is this continuity. There is this, th that's, that's the point that I'm trying to stress here. This continuity that one day, you know, many of us can be in situations where, uh, you know, survivors of genocide have been in the past. Many of us can be in situations where they have to do something about genocide. But the best time and the best place to start is here. The Armenian Genocide uh, in two 2015 is going to be the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. As I said, the, numbers of, the number of survivors continues to dwindle. And, uh, and one particularity of the Armenian Genocide is the fact that to this day, the perpetrator, the Turkish state, denies uh, and refuses to acknowledge the Armenian Genocide. So uh, while in, in, in most other cases, and uh, most definitely in many of the cases we're going to hear about today, recognition has been achieved. And there is, uh, there is that, that part of closure, although it's, it's very difficult to think about closure when it comes to, to genocide and the Holocaust has been achieved in the, in the particular case of the Armenian Genocide, despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of genocide and Holocaust scholars have researched and have established the, the fact of the Armenian Genocide, the Turkish government to this day continues to deny it. And that's another area where activism is important. That's another area where it is important to speak out and demand recognition of past genocides. I'd like to conclude with, a, with one image. Uh, in, in, in a cemetery in New York, there is a, a very, in a corner, there is this gravestone. And there's the name of an individual on it who, almost half a century ago, coined the term genocide. His family, almost his entire family, was, uh, was, 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 he lost his entire family during the Holocaust. And then he dedicated, he had started thinking about ways of uh, finding some kind of legislation that, that stops, that can prevent genocide, that can prevent states from con uh, committing mass atrocities. And after the Holocaust, he dedicates his entire life to that. And and due to his, particu particularly, his own efforts, the Genocide Convention is ratified by the UN in 1948. His name is Raphael Lemkin. Many of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard his name. When Raphael Lemkin died in 1959, there were just a few people attending his funeral, there at his funeral. The man who for decades, dedicated his life, dedicated, gave everything he had. He, he died penniless, without having anything. Died and was buried with only a few people there at his funeral. His, his, his example, his, his ideals are resonate with us today as much as they did in the past, in the past decades. And if Raphael Lemkin can dedicate his entire life to fighting against the horrors of genocide, I believe each and every one of us can find time in our busy schedules, can find that one minute in our day, can find that one day in our month and year to stand up and to do something to fight against current genocide and to struggle for justice and recognition for past genocides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool.
Thank you very much. Um, I've been thinking about what the heck I'm going to talk about with you. And what I decided to do is to talk a little bit about some personal le lessons or insights from that period in my life, uh, five years of it, between 1940 and 1945. And it starts. Uh, very much like we're a group here, we're interested in the same things, we feel sort of uh, friendly with each other, and that's how it was in the Netherlands when before 1940. So I was in school, and uh, whether you were Jewish or anything else, that was your business. If you make friends, uh, it, you were friends. Uh, I have to quickly tell you that when I came to this country and I was lucky enough to be admitted in the second year of medical school at BU, and I was uh, still under the influence of what had happened, and one of my uh, classmates invited me to join me, him for a smoker, so I didn't know what that was, a smoker in the fraternity. and. Uh, I was uh, still quite down and depressed about various things that had happened. And uh, I was glad that uh, somebody, uh, because I didn't know anybody, uh, invited me. And I went there and had a good time. And on the way back, we were walking, and he said all of a sudden to me, um, I want to ask you a question. I said, go ahead. He said, are you Jewish? I looked at him, said, why do you ask? This I just came from there. I thought I wasn't mid, uh, uh, among that uh, group anymore. He said, well, the fraternity has a, a bylaw, in the bylaws, uh, you cannot, uh, we cannot have members who are Jewish. So we have not always asked people. We made them members, and then we discovered that they were Jewish, and we had to ask them to leave. I stood still, we were still walking, I stood still. Why the heck are you asking me that? I can't believe that. But you know what you can do with your fucking fraternity? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that word that I didn't speak, uh, I had learned just a month before <laughs> in medical school when there was one guy who kept saying, fucking this and the fucking that. <laughs> and I, I hadn't learned that word in English. I spoke, my English was pretty good, but it didn't include that word. Uh, so uh, I told him what he could do with his fraternity, and I decided not to become a member of any fraternity. But uh, the point is that um, I had grown up uh, known as a Jew. Or that didn't really matter. You had friends who were some Jewish, some were not. That was not an issue. If you liked each other, you became friends. So all of a sudden, when the Nazis came to my country, it became important to them and to a lot of people whether you were Jewish or not. And that all of a sudden created a climate. But I have to say that I, I, uh, I'm thankful for surviving because of the people who were not Jewish who helped me survive. I was hidden. But when you live in a democracy where there's the same freedoms that we are familiar with here and have never experienced any kind of anti-Semitic approach by anybody, then suddenly the whole climate changed and it became an issue. That's hard to uh, adjust to, and I don't think I ever have. Um, but it was by the same token, or even stronger, that I thank my life to those people who are not Jewish, who helped me hide. And I, I just want to uh, emphasize a few personal things. F uh, 
One thing is the person who really saved, there were two who saved my life. One was where I and three other Jewish people were in hiding for two years. It was an old woman, her name was Tina, Catherine. She used to be the housekeeper of my great aunt and she knew me when I was little. She was like a member of our family. She was not married, she had no children. She was like a member of my family and it not, was not unusual. Uh, if some of you are familiar with the, the woman who discovered uh, Anna Frank's uh, diary, who worked for the family, uh, was in the same ilk. That is, this woman felt, Tina felt an obligation or a need, an inner need to help us. So four of us were there. And she was also quite religious, quite observant. So that was also part of her religious conviction. So what happened really in this whole thing is that all of a sudden the population was divided into friendly and hostile. And you hoped that the people you were dealing with who were trying to help you were friendly. Now I'm going to jump a little bit. I want to pay tribute here uh, in the presence of all of you, to my mother. And so I'm going to give you just a little anecdotal cross-section. My mother was what I call a schleppy housewife <laughs> who played bridge at least three times a week um, and who had a menopausal difficulties with headaches and she had to rest and all that. You get the picture? <laughs> this woman, during these five years, particularly the last three, saved my life and showed a courage that was incredible, incredible. And I, I feel often that I ha didn't thank her enough when she was still alive for what she did. And I can tell you stories about her, um, but uh, I'll tell you one story about her. Um, the last year was hunger. There was no food for anybody because the Germans had taken all the food back to Germany, had no food. We heard that there was a church that was handing out potatoes. Now, can you imagine what a potato was worth? More than gold in weight because there was no other food. So my mother and another woman that was in hiding uh, got a push cart and pushed it to the church where they were handing out the potatoes. And they got the potatoes. And on the way back, pushing the push cart, the cart, the wheels got stuck in the street car tracks. And no matter how they pushed and pulled, they couldn't get it to move. And where did it happen? Right in front of where the SS, the, the Nazi police, was housed. And there was a guy standing in front with his rifle on guard. And he saw these two women uh, trying to push and pull and saw that they couldn't get it out. And he put his, his rifle down, came over, and pushed, helped push the cart out of the tracks. And when he was about to leave, my mother said in hopefully poor German, you are crazy. Hitler is drinking champagne in Berlin and you are freezing your butt off. Why don't you quit? <laughs> and the guy sort of laughed a little bit, took, went back and stood and, uh, at attention with his rifle. And we got potatoes. <laughs> Now, uh, I'm telling you all, all this also because I'm a psychiatrist, by the way. Uh, watch out. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the survival mechanisms, and you needed plenty of them, hope, of course, but one of the mechanisms was humor. Can you imagine humor during this horrible time? And by the way, I jump ahead for a moment. I've worked for Facing History and Ourselves. And we used to have uh, 
annual meeting of survivors. And I used to suggest the topic around which discussions around the table of six would be uh, conducted. And one day I suggested that uh, humor would be the topic. Now, these, most of these people have been in Auschwitz, in all the well-known concentration camps. And uh, while the staff at first was shocked that I would just suggest that topic, uh, I asked some survivors, and they said, of course. So we got the, uh, a bunch of stories there that were incredible from Auschwitz, from, from all the various camps that you have probably have heard about. And it brought me, even as a psychiatrist, to think twice, or maybe more than twice, about the use of humor in, in mental health, even under those circumstances. Um, I, I should add also that at the end of that session, which was also humor, if I hope you can appreciate it, uh, there was a, we handed out a sheet on which was a, a long story. And at the end, it said uh, uh, about growing older, uh, the, the, golden times have, the golden times have come at last. The golden time can kiss my. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that story. <laughs> but, but so humor, and remember, that's not only during those horrible times, but humor is very, very helpful. Um, now, I want to end uh, these sort of introductory things with how do we live with the memory? Uh, I've lived with it a long time now with the memory. My wife was in a concentration camp, so she had much worse experience than I did. Uh, but um, thinking about that period of time that is so way, way out, particularly around those people I loved profoundly that I lost. And that is a, a part that you will never really, uh, are never able to, to, to uh, sort of detoxify. It stays with you and uh, like a foreign body. It stays with you when you think about it too much, you get tears. Because these were people that you loved profoundly and dearly. And that's the way it was. On the other hand, uh, that whole period is like a foreign body and, and uh, we go on. We go on. We don't dwell on it. We go on and have made, maybe we have a mo a, a more of an appreciation for the good life that we have led afterwards because of it. And not that I would suggest to anybody <laughs> uh, to, to volunteer for, uh, but uh, my wife and I are happy. Uh, we live in a retirement community and uh, fit in very nicely. But that foreign body, that memory remains. And that's the way it is. Sion Son. Um, thank you. Uh, I can, uh, uh, I usually share a lot of uh, my stories with high schools and you know uh, educators uh, around the countries uh, and uh, uh, in terms of my stories and, and basically uh, helping sort of heal myself um, but I'm gonna tell my story starting from my childhood to sort of coming to the United States in terms of you know the different I'm trying to capture different um, uh, experience in different era um, so uh, that, but I'm gonna spend some uh, more time uh, doing my experience uh, in in the Cambodian genocide from 1975 to 1979. Um, so I 
my current work, as you know, I'm the executive director for Light of Cambodian Children. We do provide a lot of um, after-school programs uh, for at-risk youth in the uh, low, greater low area. Um, and, and actually, it's, I'm quite really busy these days because <laughs> you sort of, I'm taking the, the agency to a different level and a, a new direction um, on how we can be more efficient and effective in providing service to um, the youth in the greater low and also um, uh, kids in Cambodia. So uh, uh, one of my projects is that to uh, the agency to build a, a university uh, or in uh, Cambodia to uh, teach and, and sort of that's one of them. Uh, the second is that I'm looking to build a, an Asian center, arts and culture center in, in a greater low area. Um, and I, you know, basically those are uh, very much and uh, very busy for me and also, you know, having all these time to, you know, sitting on the governor advisories on um, policies and, and of course, you know, uh, fundraising for my agency and also fundraise for the endowment for the scholarship that we do provide to kids um, every year. Um, so that's basically, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sort of a 24-7 kind of guy. So my wife been complaining at me, you know, well, when am I going to be resting and stay home and but um, I'm going to go on until I sort of uh, maybe drop, I guess. Um, um, so anyway, uh, in, in the my story, I was, uh, like I said, uh, in my bio, I was born in Takao province, which is a uh, country. Um, my uh, father is pretty short, um, and my mother seemed to be a little bit taller uh, and white, so I guess maybe I sort of, you know, take my mother's genes. So I'm a little taller than my my, my dad. Um, but I was taken away or separated from my parents in when I was seven years old. Um, now, what happened is that my uh, friends and I, at the same age, were one day walking on a rice field. You know, uh, chasing after uh, crickets and frogs uh, uh, and and others, as you know, watching uh, cock fights and everything while you guys over here, you know, grow up watching G.I. Joe, play Barbie dolls and, and all that. So we, we basically, that's, that's our sort of um, childhood's memories. Um, that's what we get to play with, frogs and crickets and, and stuff. Um, but one day, um, I, you know, my friend and I walking in rice fields and we see this, um, you know, uh, children sort of on a truck, you know. And, and we thought that that's probably something that's fun because they all were, as you know, kids, they don't think about the consequences. Uh, you, uh, you know, put children in together, all you hear is, is laughing and giggling and all that kind. So that's what I thought. I saw kids on these trucks um, and I thought it was fun. You know, let's join the fun. You know, I don't want to miss it. So I got on there and if I wasn't get on it, I was, would be forced to get on it. So, and, you know, I thought it was just a quick trip, uh, you know, going there and then they're probably going to take me back to my, uh, my parents. But that was the last time I've seen my family, uh, which is uh, seven years old. So they brought me to this children camp, and when I entered the gate, I saw uh, truckloads of children also leaving, and there you go, sort of supporting my thought that, the theory that they are being sent back home, but it's not that's the case. It, what happened is the people who, the children who are leaving the camp, it's basically now a full-pledged Khmer Rouge. It's sending to different uh, regions within Cambodia to be Khmer Rouge. Uh, peop, uh, kids who already graduated from their training um, uh, from the camp. So what I, you know, I guess when I get in there, it was tough. I thought to myself that, you know, hoping that one day I would be able to see my family, and I have not seen them since till today, tonight. I have not seen any of them. Um, so at the children camp, I was being trained. Uh, the government told me that my siblings and my parents are now my enemy. The people surrounded me in my groups 
are my enemies. I do not trust anyone. I, I told us not to trust anybody. I was told to report to the government what are the children said about Anka. Unlike United States, you have freedom of speech. You can say negative things about your president, but not in Cambodia. Even if you say that the government does not treat me well, you can be executed. Imagine that you are at seven or eight years old and you are taught about this. Hatred is something that we learn every day. Love is forbidden. Could be anything. If they caught you, that you show some sympathy or emotional that you can be executed. People being put to work 24 hours a day with a small grain of rice. Now, when I say that, it's not every regional in Cambodia during the genocide are starving. In some area or regional, you have plenty of food. They did not abuse you. They let you do whatever you sort of within boundaries. Not everybody doing the genocide experienced the same punishment and hardship. I was trained to use weapons at the age of nine. I know how to use an M16, an AK-47, and a nine millimeters. I can shoot like anybody else, like the adult can, because that's what we do. Every day we listen to the government told us that we, me, my soul belong to them. I did not own anything at all. Anything that I own belong to them. One of our training that they take into is to prison camps. And what you can see is that you can see rows of people laying there and you see blood everywhere. You want it to feel sad, you want it to hope, but you can't. You will be killed. And I know that part of our training that they also practice is that when you are accused of something, they put you in the middle and they would stand us in a circle and they would choose one of us to do an execution, blank shot. I see them all. Yes, you may say, wow, you sort of look fairly okay, kind of, kind of young to go through, you know, uh, to survive the genocide, but that's not too long ago. It's only about 35 years ago. I think if I got my mathematics right, which I'm not good at math in high school anyway. Um, but that's, you can imagine, at that age, you are putting into this. Then I became immune. You know, I'm immune to whatever they told us and do. I thought to myself, I remind myself, I think that is normal thing. That's how human behave by their practice. Because I do not have any formal education prior to the genocide. I have no access to outside world. I thought Cambodian were the only human being exists on earth. I don't know you guys was existed at all until I have arrived to Thailand and of course came in here to the United States. Do I thought of being escape? Do I thought of being rebellious against the government because of practice? No. I have no thought of it at all. I just do what I told. And to survive, that's what I did. 
I did to survive. Fortunately, I did not have any um, experience executing someone. In 1979, skip a little bit, uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia, and I would uh, flee to Thailand, stay at a refugee camp called Sakao One. There, we all, mostly all the Khmer, former Khmer Rouge stay. And I also experienced that 16, 14, 15 year old girls are being raped every night. Not just from the Khmer Rouge itself, but from the Thai people. It could be the soldiers or people who live around there. They are being beat up, they are being robbed, and they were being humiliated. People were scared. I seen people in Thailand being shot or being kicked to death. I stayed in Thailand for about three years, and in late 1983, I believe September 29, 1983, I was um, half been arrived to the United States and lived my adopted uh, parents in uh, Middletown, Connecticut. I was then about 14 or 15 and uh, have no uh, spoke, I haven't speak a single word of English in 1983. So it was tough. Everything is completely alien to me. The people, the building, the car, the toilet, whatever, you, you name it all. This is all new to me because I, I live in a jungle pretty much. Uh, you know, you sleep in a jungle, you, you do whatever you need to do when you need to shower, you just jump in a pond somewhere in the river. Uh, you know, you don't use no soap or anything, you'll just you know, dry, you know, that, that's what we do. And come here to the United States, even completely new. I was like, whoa, who is this brunette woman waiting for me? <laughs> is it, you know, this is, is my mom. I mean, she's brunette. And, um, you know, she hold a sign putting my name up and, and I walked to, toward her and, you know, uh, it, was, it was a strange feeling. Uh, it was strange. So anyway, after about maybe a month or so, she threw me in ninth grade. Uh, how fun it is, huh? <laughs> ninth grade. And I can remember that the first day that I went to school, I sat in one class the entire day, right? You all know you have seven periods where every 45 minutes you have to change class. And what did I know? I don't speak nothing. I just sat there all day. And the teacher looking at me, what am I going to do with this guy? You know, uh, so I sat there. By the second week, they took me out from the um, regular class and put me in ESL. So I have, I have to start ABC actually in my high school. So I study ABC and ESL. And it's very funny. A lot of people, because I don't speak English and, and all, all these things, it's a funny story. Um, you know, people look at me weird. I think, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm different. <coughs> uh, and, and, and one of the things that I remember that, and I thought was, what? A nice guy. When he saw me, I guess you all are dull enough to say, he stick a middle finger at me, and I was so happy. I said, yes, I may, at least I make a friend. I make a friend. He stick a middle finger at me a couple of times. And I, I was just like, I was like, Hi. yeah, all right. I was so happy that somebody actually looked right at me and, and of course, that was when I learned that's not the case, and you know. <laughs> I've been called names, 
uh, call a ching a gook, uh, you know, go back to your countries and all that kind of stuff. I've been called in, in high school. Uh, one quick example was that, and I don't know the rule, and I think by, by the third year or, you know, uh, the second year in high school, I had built three friends. Well, two friends, including me with three. And they're all Asian. I have a Chinese friend, and I have a Korean friend. We used to get in trouble all the time. Right? The, the, you know, the school administrators don't know this. So, uh, we fight all the time because... All I know is that if I have issue, the only way to solve that problem is by physical. And that's what I train to do. I'm an expert in that. In any case, after I met them, we sort of hang out together all the time. So, you know, when we were young, we sort of had some fun too. We doing all these kung fu things, you know, and, and, and practice. We practiced a lot. We practiced a lot of martial art um, in high school. You know, I, uh, I used nunchakus. I, we do all kind of, um, you know, karate, and we do other type of um, uh, kung fu. We teach other, uh, each other. Now, I'm would be the sort of the, the freshman of the class because the other two have been here for a while and of course they actually study from a real martial art master and they taught me. So they, they taught me how to do this. And, and of course I hit myself with nunchaku in the back all the time because you do, you know, like this. Oh, you know. But that's what we do. When we get in trouble in high school, in school, we don't fight in school. We say, you want to take it outside? Name the place and time. Yeah, we have some football player. You know, they all macho and built up. And what they don't notice that we study martial art and we do have weapons. <laughs> <laughs> they find out the hard way. We take them in the wood and beat the crap out of them. <laughs> okay. But that's what we do. We, that's what it is. I don't do that now. So don't, <laughs> don't take that personal. Um, and then one perfect experience that the rule of the games, of course, floor hockey. You all play floor hockey, that little orange ball. Okay? And the rule of the game is you allow to check a little bit, right? Here I am facing a 240-pound 6'2 person I'm a 90 pounds, about five foot feet high. You know, you know when he come in and I, I try to go get the ball, he sort of, I don't think he intentionally hurt me though, but I take it personal. Um, <laughs> he was sort of just a little check and I would fly and hit the bleachers. It was so painful. The next time he got the ball, I whack him with a hockey stick. So, the lesson learned is that I think, you know, uh, it all, uh, of course, you have some uh, other questions that I can answer personally on. Um, but, you know, it's, it's funny how we tend to judge each other by the cover. It's painful when you do that. You call people names. You call each other's names. You are, you know, a bystander. It's also, it's causing, you know, prejudice and causing harm emotionally to people that you have no idea and you don't know of what he or she been through life. You know. So. I guess thank my, my closing is that I think, uh, you know, uh, thank you uh, so much. And, and, and that's why, you know, one of the things that I do now is, of course, I hold a degree in sociology um, and my wife uh, uh, hold uh, a degree in psychology. We sometimes doesn't really get along on our debates on different issues, how to, you know, deal thing with, with people. Um, but 
the reason why I chose to do with this is that you know I I been it all I do it all I I've been in the law enforcement I was working at the low police department for about four years um, doing all these and seeing all these crazy cases that we have to deal um, um, and 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 uh, but you know I I would say. Uh, last thing is to say thank you to Rachel. I think we communicate through emails, um, Sophie, um, and then so also uh, Rabbi for having us over here. Uh, I, and, and I hope you take uh, or learn something tonight so that you can uh, sort of go uh, back and reflect on on our story that make you stronger in 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 trying to prevent the most complex thing to do. Uh, which is preventing genocide or human rights uh, uh, issue. So thank you very much, and uh, well, ciao. Thank you. Yes, Yasmina. Yasmina Chesser. Hi. Sayon, if it makes you feel any better, I came here without speaking a word in English. And I felt funny also in my ESL class when my teacher asked me, what's your name? I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> but anyway, I'm from Bosnia, a small country in Eastern Europe that was once part of the former Yugoslavia. And let me give you some history. The Yugoslavia consisted of six republics, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Macedonia, was a place where Jews, Muslims, Orthodox Serbs, and Catholic Croats lived next door to each other, went to school together, and intermarried. And though there were exclusively Muslim villages, Croats villages, Serbs villages, um, all the cities of any sides were tolerant and integrated. Stories that we heard from our grandparents, what Chetniks, the Serbs nationalists, have done to the Muslims during World War II, and how neighbor turned against neighbor, were just that for us stories. We seldom gave them a second thought. People my age really didn't think those things had anything to do with us. All we care pretty much is like you do now, where is the next party, who is going to show up, and what places to visit during the summer vacation. Most of my life I lived in Bosnia when it was a part of communist Yugoslavia and we youngsters thought it was the safest place on earth. My friends and my teammates, regardless of our religion and the fact that some of us were Muslims and some were Serbs, enjoyed traveling all over Yugoslavia and competing with teams from different republics of Yugoslavia. Sport was a big part of our life and mine in particular. My sister and I were on the swim team and Although I never was as good as my sister, who was the best swimmer in our region, I enjoyed all the commotion and traveling. However, I was the best ping pong woman player. But then, in 1990, Yugoslavia began to break apart, and suddenly what was once our normal life changed. The Yugoslav National Army, which was the fourth largest in Europe, and which every boy 18 and older, including my siblings, had to serve for one full year, became property of Serbia. And it turned its guns against its own people. Imagine that this army went to a people whose slogan was kill everybody who is not Serb and bring and unite all the Serbs into one nation called Greater Serbia. They started to accomplish this goal in 1990 when the Yugoslav army attacked Slovenia but Slovenia was one of those six Yugoslav republics with a small Serbian population, and the war lasted only seven days. Then they moved to Croatia, where they killed thousands of people and destroyed cities like Dubrovnik, the ancient city on the Croatian coast you visited. <laughs> In 1992, with their dream of greater Serbia, they came to Bosnia with, when Ali Begovic, the leader of Bosnian multi-ethnic government, asked for independence for Bosnia, and it was recognized as independent by the United States and European Union. By the end of 1993, the Serbs had, um, they set up their own Republic of Srpska within the borders of newly recognized Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
and the Serbian army supported by Yugoslav National Army and Serbia was in control of nearly three quarters of the country. The UN refused to intervene, apart from sending some troop convoys for humanitarian aid. Later, its peacekeeping force, UMPROFOR, undertook to protect six UN safe areas, including the capital city of, Sarajevo, or capital city of Bosnia, Sarajevo, and it failed. Almost each so-called safe area fell to the Serbs, and it was ethnically cleansed. In 1995, the Serbs committed the worst massacre in Europe since World War II in the small town of Sebrenz in eastern Bosnia that was one of the safe, six safe areas. They systematically rounded up and killed around 8,000 Bosnian Muslims, mainly men and boys. Among those killed were my sister-in-law, two brothers and father. Barack Obama described the Srebrenica massacre as a stain on our collective conscience. In a statement read for him in the small town of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia, the US president admitted the failure of an international community to protect the enclave, and he said that those responsible must be pursued. He also added that there can be no lasting peace without justice. Unfortunately, mass killings, rape and torture of innocent civilians took place in other parts of Bosnia, including my hometown of Visegrad, where my two brothers, my father, my grandmother, and many of my friends were killed. In Visegrad, 70% of the population was Muslims, but that before, before Serbs came. After that, there was no Muslims left. Thousands were brutally murdered, like my brother Samir, who was only 15 at the time. The Serbs threw him off a bridge with another boy his age and shot them as they were falling. My grandmother was burnt in, alive in her own house, as were many others. Numerous women and girls were raped. Some were taken to prison, like my father, where they were constantly tortured. And the rest of the Visegrad population was forced to leave the city. My mother, my surviving siblings, and my very pregnant sister-in-law were among those forced to flee. My newly wed husband, who was my high school sweetheart, whom I married just a couple of months before the war, sought a refugee in the capital city of Bosnia, Sarajevo, which we naively thought was a safe haven. We honestly believed that the world wouldn't let anything happen to this European city that was a home to 1984 Winter Olympics. However, as soon as we arrived in Sarajevo in April of 1992, the Serbian army surrounded the city with their tanks in ditches and started shelling. We were hungry and we didn't have access to drinkable water, but our biggest problems were snipers and contest shelling. We had nothing to defend ourselves with, but we organized into groups and called it the Bosnian army. We refused to be killed by the Serbs without fighting back, but every day was harder and harder and hospitals became full. I, like any other Bosnian, wanted to be the part of the defense, and I started assisting in the hospital. My help didn't last long. One morning, my husband and I were waiting for a bus to take us to work when a mortar fell one meter from us. My husband was instantly killed. He was blown in half, and I was badly wounded. I lost my right arm, and I had heavy wounds to both my legs. But, as I said in my book, no matter what happens to us, no matter how bad things look, there is always the next thing to do and the next step to take. Tiny steps took me from my hospital bed, crawling through the Sarajevo airport, which was the only way out from the besieged city, into Germany and here in America. As for my country, it saw the end of the war at the end of 1995 with the signing of Dayton Peace Agreement. Dayton Peace Agreement allowed the Serbs to keep what they gained in the ethnic cleansing but at least it stopped killing. Slowly but surely, things are going better. 
the Serbian government for the first time last year issued an apology for the 1995 Srebrenica massacre. No apology, no matter what, will bring back my brothers, my friends, and my grandmother back. But my only hope is that such an apology will open the door to a brighter future for new generations. And I want to see them live in a world where a crime has no color, race, or religion, but is wrong regardless. And for that, it needs to be punished if it cannot be stopped. And certainly not doing anything about it invites more such crimes in other places. And Rabbi Sherry and everyone who is involved in tonight's, I want to thank you for doing something. Thank you. Thank you. Eugenie Mukishima, Mama. Good evening. I don't know what else I can add to what you have already heard from my colleagues here. The only thing that I see that is uniting us here is the sense of loss that we suffered. And at the hands of people who should not have done that. And the helplessness of the situation that we all survived. I grew up in Rwanda, and uh, for some who have visited Rwanda, if you go there tomorrow, it's a very beautiful place. Um, in Rwanda, we speak one language. Uh, we don't have different um, culture or anything. You know, if you worked in Rwanda, everybody is the same. And actually, traditionally, uh, you could go from one house to another. Um, in the evening, you could sleep at anybody's house. You were always home as long as you spoke the language. Uh, we were known um, historically as hostile to foreigners. And you were a foreigner if you could not speak the language. Otherwise, inside, it didn't really matter that you were Hutu or Tutsi or anything else. Uh, you were just uh, Rwandese, and everybody was so happy about their nationality and uh, very patriotic. I grew up listening to stories sometimes, eavesdropping, of course, my, uh, in my culture when elders are getting together and they are talking serious talks, uh, kids should not be around. I, now when I think about it, yeah, they had a good reason to keep us at bay. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was growing up, I grew up in a very uh, progressive area, part of Rwanda, um, and it was progressive because it was an area in the southern part of the country, and the government at the time did not uh, want anyone from the south of Rwanda to get anything, pretty much. So whether you were Hutu or Tutsi, and you came from whatever they considered the south, you were out of luck. Education, discrimination in workplace, in the army, and everything, it became the same. So the people from the south, felt that they need to unite themselves, you know, uh, to survive. And I grew up in an area where Hutu or Tutsi was not an issue, although the government never encouraged anyone saying the word Tutsi. But we were pretty much sheltered from what was happening outside. I didn't know that there were some um, Tutsis uh, who have lived in Rwanda and were living in refugee camps outside of Rwanda, in, in Uganda, in Burundi. We didn't know. And then when I was in high school, the war broke out. The first time I heard that there were Tutsis, who refi refugees who were coming back in the country, and I, and I grew up listening to the radio station. My dad made us listen to the radio, to the news. And it was all the news about Mozambique, about Angora, about the wars in, you know, in, in Western Sahara, in, you know, in, in Iran, Iraq, all over the place. It's surprising that today, we, when we listen to the news, it's the same. Nothing changed, pretty much. And, but I 
had no clue what the war, a war really is. Um, in Rwanda, it's very tiny, small. So if you, you, you know, the war that started at the border, it's only like two hours away from Kigali. And of course, in a country where, you know, you don't have, you know, newspapers, you don't have cable, you don't have TV, you know, it's just everything is rumors now. Everybody has a story. And each story is completely different. And nobody knows what the truth is. So we were all terrified. But for the first time in my life, the word Tutsi meant something. People started looking at you differently. They started pointing fingers. And you could say, even if they don't open up their mouth to say something, you could see that they're talking about you. It's just a cultural code they had. And from just looking at you, the next day, you start seeing people pretty much coming to you and say, you know, what are you doing here? This is not your place. Do you have a weapon? Are you a spy? So being a Tutsi became sort of defined as almost the enemy of the regime in place because now the Tutsis in the country were associated with uh, the uh, Rwandan Patriotic Army that was fighting. And so for anything that could happen to you, they could always say, you know, they are spying for the other group. We learn to live in that kind of environment where you don't go out freely, you know, you need to get home a certain time. There are some neighborhoods you're not allowed to work in, and if somebody looks at you, spits in your face, you don't say anything, you just work away. That went on for a while. But increasingly, we got propaganda going. So they created this whole radio station. And this radio station pretty much, it was entertaining. Now I have to say that, you know, the national radio station we had, which was owned by the government, was pretty boring. So they became very entertaining, uh, you know, and, and people just could not get enough of it. But of course what was entertaining in some ways was the fact that they could they did not go by the code that we, we were used you know, to, to, to see in the country. They broke all the rules. They started talking about Tutsis, and they started talking about politicians, and they started telling people that you know, things have to change. And the main message was always that the problems of the country was that there were Tutsis in the country and that they have not done a good job back in 1959 when they killed them. And those ones who were, had remained uh, protected by the neighbors, the Hutu neighbors, um, are now showing them that it was a pretty big mistake to leave anybody alive. And they will go as far as to say that a cockroach breeds another cockroach. You cannot expect anything different. A snake is not going to give you anything but another snake. So we got used to being called cockroaches and snakes, but of course we're human being and you know they can say whatever they want. It doesn't really register. And it didn't register because we see I went to a high school, we studied about you know world history, and they wanted to go to the Holocaust. They only said it's world history. It was Second World War. They never mentioned the Jewish people who were killed. They never mentioned what the war was all about. It was about the winner and the loser and the why they lost the war. We didn't know that this whole thing could come down to a genocide. And by the time the genocide came about in 1994, I was, I was married, I was eight months pregnant, and we were still naive. The president is dead, okay, this is Africa. He was in the military anyway. So to me, this is a military coup, and it's gonna go on for three days. A bunch of politicians will be killed. Some rich people will die, but not me and my family. We were all wrong, even though they have said before that they would kill everybody, but we didn't believe that. Long story short, 
Um, we got attacked the same day after the president was killed. The first attack that came, uh, these are the neighbors. I didn't know the names, but I know the faces. The day before the morning, we, 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 we went, you know, these are the same people we stood at the same bus station every morning to catch the bus going to work. And I saw them in the evening, occasionally I say hi, they said hi. We didn't have an issue with them. But they came home to my house. They had machetes, they had hand grenades, and, and they had everything. See, in Rwanda, you could only know how to manipulate arms if you have been in the military. And we didn't have a draft law. So only people who have got some military training could manipulate guns. And it was surprising to me that these guys who were not in the military as far as I knew had guns and had hand grenades. And now it's all started making sense a little bit. Yes, the publications and the propaganda, whatever, for us propaganda was something that you say, but you're almost bragging it's not gonna happen. And that's what we believed. Now, it is confirming the rumors that people have been trained to carry out the killing. And they were not quiet about it. They came, they bright, and they pretty much said, well, we're here to kill you, we bargained. We said we did not kill the president. They said, of course we know that you couldn't do it. Who are you to kill the president anyway? But some Tutsi did it, and therefore, you all have to pay the price. This time, none of, no Tutsi living in this country will survive. We gave them money, they left, and uh, we got the second group because they said they will be back. Sure enough, some of the guys from the previous, the first group, they came with on the second group. This negotiations now, we give them more money, they leave, and then they said, you know, they will be back. Yes, before the night fall, the third group was at our door. We had run out of money, so because they knew some of the guys, they knew how much money the previous group have received, they said they couldn't take what we had. It was just too little. We opened up the doors to the house. They took whatever they wanted to take that night. And then we left. Uh, when we left the house, we just left with clothes on our back. We didn't take anything because we were still thinking this is gonna be maybe two, three days. And still we could not, you know, it's really hard to explain this, but you cannot, you cannot imagine that somebody, you don't have any issue, any fight or anything, who is not accusing you of having done something to them or their friend, that they will come to your house to kill you just because they don't like your ethnic background. It is unthinkable. So we went to the people that we knew that could help us, the way Hutus, just, you know, it was, we basically got in and said, you know, we just need a place to sleep tonight. The wife was very nice about it, and she said, well, she can help. But the husband, when he came, he also had a hand grenade. And he pretended almost like he never met us before. I thought this was a show because he's, you know, he had a very pretty good humor, but, and then I, I realized that he's not joking. He kicked us out, out of his home. We spent the night in nearby high school. We went back to his house um, um, the next day and we pretty much got him to tell us pretty much that, you know, this is really a genocide. And the whole one day or two days is not gonna happen. Everybody's gonna die, that's according to him. And that it was true that they have, you know, they have drawn on the list of people to, to be killed. And beyond just the names of the Tutsis, they also had the names of the Hutu friends, neighbors, who might hide them. So he said, I can't help you because if they don't find you at your home, the next place to come is here because they know we're friends. We persuaded him to find us some other place to hide. So they took me to this house, a um, family that I've, I've never met before. And um, there was, you know, there was really no place to hide. So uh, what they decided to do, they took me to the, um, the children's bedroom, 
underneath the bed, and there was just this much space, and I'm just like this much pregnant, and um, I crawled underneath the bed, and that was my, you know, my house for a couple of weeks, and then a couple of months. Um, we got discovered from that place because as they were killing people, they would check them off the list, and then they realized that there's some people missing. And because there were roadblocks, they knew pretty much that people are within that neighborhood. They can't be far away from there. So they started searching from house to house, looking for anybody who might be hiding, and they were killing people that they found. I was lucky that morning when they, we were discovered. Um, there were other women who had been hiding, hiding in that family. And of course, when you know, how do you live in such conditions when uh, the timing of the genocide was kind of you know, um, interesting too because they, they, they timed the genocide around the Easter time when the kids are home uh, from boarding schools. Um, but you didn't give a situation where the government closed down everything. Uh, all of a sudden, people can't go to work. There is no work to go to. The government offices are closed. Uh, you can't go to the market. There is no market. The hospitals are closed. Schools are closed. Everything is shut down. So which made every average person, every person actually in the country, um, guys, pretty much equal. Your doctorate degree didn't matter. All you had to do during the day is to go to kill or you'll be hiding. It made them equal and they kind of like took that role exactly. Um, they could not get out of it and say, you know, I'm going to work or something. And I think they got used to it and they kind of embraced it and they went ahead and did everything the same way as if there is no difference in terms of like, you know, thinking and, and you know, actually maybe, you know, doubt that what if, what if we don't kill all of these people? And what if we killed all of these people? How do we get away from, you know, with the crime? All of these people who were educated, which is, you know, very um, scary to think about, that people who do these kind of crimes are not necessarily people who have like a twisted mind or cannot really realize they don't know what they're doing. It's not. Germany is not too long ago. And I think they were very pretty educated people in that country. How come they d proceeded to do what they did? Bosnia is not too long ago. So uh, that makes this whole crime to me more sophisticated and also uh, more scary because you can't rule out anybody. Um, I ended up having my baby um, in the hiding place because there was no hospital to go to. And even if the hospital was open, I couldn't get there. Um, my husband had been taken to hide in a different home. And since the first, the second day of the genocide, that's the last time I saw him. I never saw him again. Um, after I had the baby, uh, we were taken to a killing site. Now, one thing that I want to stress here is that Genocides are not just about killing people. If you look at each one of them, there is a high level of torture involved. It is just scary to me just to think about it that way. In Rwanda, people went as far as doing the experiment. You see, we didn't need the machinery, you know, in the industrial aspect to carry out the genocide in Rwanda. People used the tools they had, and they organized whichever way they wanted to do it. But to see people do experimenting the killing, each day competing for who came up with the new best way to do it. And the new best way meaning that how can you prolong the act of killing another human being is just, you know, un unthinkable. Now, I am happy to say that my daughter survived, and we both survived. And we did not survive because we were able to run away or we rescued in any fashion. 
um, we ended up in a home that was run by high-ranking militia men who um, have earned that position because during the genocide, one of the things that the media did was to, you know, the same radio station carried out some, you know, they, they, they kept entertaining the guys who were doing, you know, the killings. And one of the things, they, the program they had, they will have a program that call, you know, um, at the end of the day, they will pick someone that they call that person a hero. And uh, he will be a hero because he killed so many people. Some of those stories were made up just to incite people to do more and keep going. Um, and so this guy, he had killed so many people that he emerged as the leader of the other militia in the area. I ended up in his home, but he has stolen so many stuff from um, the people, the families that he have killed. And uh, one day he took, um, when the war was getting really tough around Chigari, so he would take some of the stuff that he had stolen and try to take to move them to a safer location. So one move he made, he couldn't get back because they lost the city. If he had been around, I would have been killed. Um, that's the deal I had with him. You could pay during the genocide, get shot. If they're willing to take the money and willing to do so, to kill you. Um, if you don't have the money too bad, you're gonna have to face the machete. So I had done a deal with him that I will cook for him, but when the time to kill me and my baby because I didn't have the money, he would have to shoot me and shoot the baby. Um, he wasn't around, so that didn't happen, or, and that's why I'm alive today. And uh, my baby survived, but um, my dad, when I, um, when the genocide was over, um, I found out that my dad, who was a teacher, uh, had been killed by the same student he taught in school. <laughs> yeah, I went to school with them, and they were my best friend when I we were growing up. I was to find out my my sister had been killed. My mom survived and two other brothers and I two I had two sisters who were not in Rwanda at the time. Now um my mom unfortunately like uh she she couldn't fully recover. Uh it's one thing and I think this is another thing to keep in mind. Um I think you talked about closure. It is impossible to get closure when there's no grave. It is impossible when you don't have the truth about what happened to people. And I think in oh, all these mass, um, you know, mass killings, that's another loss that you have and you can't really do anything about it. And um, how do you expect people to recover? You mentioned about memory. A lot of things that survivors deal with, it's one thing to survive, but after you survive, that's really when the battles start. It's not very hard to survive. It's the after surviving that is hard to manage. And um, the memories, the uh, justice, there is no justice for genocide. You can't really get in. Um, even things like people getting back to normal life. Some mothers can't take their kids to a soccer game because they can't stand the sound of a whistle. So the impact of these crimes on the victims and the survivors, they go much deeper than, you know, than we think. And I think it's very important, and I had to say this because when people commit some money and resources to make sure that institutions like this one put time and effort in educating people and students and faculty and the community about these crimes, that is something very commendable. I wish we had more of people doing this kind of work. But also want to tell you that you're very lucky to be at a school like this and to be able to have these programs. 
because I've been to many schools, they don't have this. People are fighting to get even in the high school to acknowledge, to add in the history books that the genocide or the Holocaust happened. Why do we have to survive and have to fight for the recognition of a history that happened when everybody was able to see this? You're talking about who people are denying that the Holocaust happened. People are denying, as I'm saying, I'm standing here, that the genocide didn't want to happen. We still have bones and, and, and graves that are open. You know, what else can we provide to prove to that? And what is shameful is that some institution, they give platform to these kind of guys to actually go out and preach that nonsense. I think we have to be more responsible. And you are young, you are gonna go out, you're gonna become the policy makers. So do the right thing. That's the only thing that I'm asking tonight. Thank you. We're really honored to have you with us here as our teachers this evening. We have, um, we have some time for questions uh, for people. Um, maybe ask some general questions and we'll have time for people on the panel who want to respond to respond. We're going to end our program by nine o'clock uh, um, precisely so people will know. Um, but we'll have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for, for questions now. There's, if people could either stand at the microphones or, um, or ask your question loud and I'll repeat it, please, sir. Did people hear the question? I was not in a camp, so I didn't uh, experience the horrors, but uh, it has been so important to me and to my wife, who was in a concentration camp, to make everything and get out everything in our life to be building, to be happy, to have a family again, because most of the family was gone. That, that has been uh, the joie de vivre, the, the need to be alive and you be alive, meaning uh, live a life that has meaning. And that was, uh, to us personally, getting back at the murderers, the, the, uh, the ones that uh, I didn't know personally, but the notion to get back at the per by living. And I want to just uh, uh, enter something else into this. Uh, I have been looking for an, o <laughs> an opening to do this. Uh, I have been talking in schools now for probably 20 plus years for facing history. So I have a lot of history uh, in terms of getting feedback after I tell my story. And uh, one of the interesting things that has happened to me uh, happens, has happened is that while uh, in the beginning, when I tell the story, uh, people, the kids want to know more about the horrors. More recently, uh, the feedback I get when they write me letters or something after I've been there is about uh, building a life after it's been destroyed. So there's a whole different uh, notion that is maybe because of the distance in time from, from when it all happened, but uh, that is, uh, to me, a very interesting thing. So that is the joie de vivre, the need to live, to have a life, and to get back at them by having a life. 
Yeah, if I may add something, I think part of what happens to a lot of survivors, I think some people wonder, you know, what is what is your state of mind actually when you come out of it? You know, what do you want to do or what, you know, um, I think a lot of us didn't, didn't really get that time to look back. There is no time for that. Uh, part of it is dealing with the loss and trying to understand what happened. Uh, in case of Rwanda, it's going back and digging bones and, and going to funerals and funerals and funerals. But in terms of taking life, actually your own life, just because life is getting tough, it, it doesn't happen because it's sort of like giving a it, a nice thing on the cake to the people who wanted to take it anyway. So most survivors will not go that road. Uh, you have to get better, as you said, um, and that's the best revenge, is that you have to be functional and you have to be successful and be better than the perpetrators, basically. Great. It's also accepting part. I mean, as a survivor, you don't try to forget things. You just mm -hmm. try to accept whatever happens to you and try to live with it. And But they say tragedy either torn you into pieces or makes you stronger and for most of us survivors it makes you more determined and to stay on your own and help other people that were in similar situations like yours. I think uh, early on in my life when I came here in the United States was that I thought of uh, suicide or committing suicide but then there are two options uh, for me when I think about it that one, should I kill myself and forget everything or should I survive and tell my story to the world so that we can help prevent um, you know, genocide from happening. And if I kill myself, then that would defeat the purpose because that's, you know, they want you dead. Um, so by being surviving, being strong, using that to balance what I do nowadays is definitely um, it's in a way of, of winning and, and also deal with my experience. Let's get some more questions uh, because, yes, up there. Thank you, all of you, for coming to speak to us tonight. I was wondering about what you think about the laws in certain countries that illegalize the denial of certain genocides. Thank you. The laws that make it illegal to deny genocide. Um, <coughs> freedoms, uh, freedom of speech can, uh, can, can only go uh, to a particular uh, degree. You, you cannot just stand up in front of these individuals and in the name of freedom of speech uh, feel entitled to deny the suffering that they went through. It is, it is you know, it's, it's, it is a huge debate these days whether to have, you know, to, to have uh, parliaments pass resolutions, whether to have uh, a banning, a genocide denial, denial of the Holocaust, denial of the Armenian genocide in several countries, including France, uh, Switzerland. But, and, and of course, there is the argument to be made that freedom of speech takes precedence. But, 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 but the issue at hand is, is the following. I mean, you, when, when you are uh, in front of, f confronted by an overwhelming uh, evidence, historically, you know, from, from all the genocides we talked about, in the Armenian case, if you go to the Syria, in the, in, to the deserts of Deir Zor, to this day, 95 years, 96 years after the Armenian genocide, you just scratch the surface and you, you see bones coming out. Every single inch of those areas are covered in bones. So it is extremely difficult to really have somebody stand up and tell you that, you know what, what you experienced, what your grandparents experienced is not true. It did not happen. So I do believe that in that sense, uh, there has to be a certain uh, legislation that prevents people from uh, committing that kind of uh, hate speech. There's no other word for it. Other questions? Let, let's get some other student questions, yeah. It took, it took some survivors decades. Please speak loud. It took some survivors decades to be able to tell their
Did you, was it difficult for you to tell your stories? For me, when I came to the United States, I didn't speak a word of English, but I felt I had to educate my fellow citizen in the United States what was happening, because when I came here in 1993, the war was still going on in Bosnia. The genocide happened in 1995, and I, I just wanted to tell my story. I was going from Philadelphia, Washington, um, San Antonio. I was giving speeches everywhere in a little English that I could speak. So it, for me, it was a healing process. And it helped me feel better to do something for my country. So I think what pushed me to begin talking um, I didn't really think that much about, I didn't know how hard it would get. And, uh, but I studied because I, I went, when I went to college, I will go to class, of course, and then the teacher, the new professor will get the list of the student, and he will call the name just to see who is in the class. And when they get to my name, they get stuck because it's not common. And they will ask me, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Rwanda. Next. It didn't ring any bell to them. And this is in 2002. And I kept wondering, what, how is it possible that, is it because they don't know? Is it because they just don't want to talk about it? So I started talking, I, I started speaking out of anger because I was angry that they, they, you know, they didn't know. And um, it was very difficult, uh, it's very difficult you, you can talk and you can numb your emotion and control them. Sometimes they get you. But it's a different, you know, what happens at night when you go to bed or the next day is, you know, is, is different. But I, it's very hard. But it's a necessary thing to do. Um, for, for me, it's very difficult in the sense that I have internal conflicts as to who should I really blame um, in, in one sense and one feeling that I'm, I hate and I, I, I sort of mad at my parents for disown, disown me uh, for, you know, so that, and, and the second is that, uh, you know, when I talk, what should I, you know, should I basically focus on my childhood's uh, experience doing, doing the genocide or is it blaming my, my parents? So basically for me it was not in a sense of expression um, of, of my experience, but it's, it's just internal uh, conflict between the two uh, topic. Yes. Uh, I, I guess to all uh, the people who are speakers, and whatever your reaction is to the way that genocide is portrayed in the media or in popular culture, because I know there's some controversy that this is really through this way, not too much through like this personal account or through history, that a lot of people get a grasp of genocide. They can even get introduced to the subject of genocide. So like when, when an author like publishes a fantasy novel about genocide or when a movie like Schindler's List or Hotel of London comes out, are, are you like encouraged that people now like that the subject of genocide is being presented to a mass audience? Or does it frustrate you to some extent that people know about this stuff, not through like real accounts, real testimony, or just but just some author or filmmakers Uh, for me, I think um, it's good that people now sort of um, starting to make film about genocide. Uh, one, one thing that I uh, I think is uh, is important to focus on what they do is sort of a mixed um, true and 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 sort of fiction um, in in most um, genocide. I think I would value more of a personal documentary. Uh, people tend to keep to the true stories um, and not fiction in that sense. Uh, Movie-wise, it's just they, they're using, so it's, it's marketing media, um, sort of money drive. Um, so I'm not sort of a big fan of, of movie actually produced by Hollywood. Um, but it, I'm glad that they at least, you know, telling uh, what, what I see also that a lot of people sort of tend to ignorance about really happening. They sort of uh, questions on, on that. Uh, when, when it's being portrayed in the movie, uh, uh, is sort of from Hollywood, something like that, is the, uh, a lot of people don't know about. Um, and I think it needs to be there, but I think it should be in a, a documentary rather than the Hollywood uh, movie. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, for, you know, these, these films are actually, it's, it's a great question, are actually 
uh, a source for education. They are a source for triggering individuals to look more for this kind of, for more information. You know, it's, uh, it is, it, and, that, and that's the issue. We cannot expect from, from all media to treat everything just like in any other uh, topic. You know, it, there's always uh, so much that you can see on TV. You know, a journalist has, uh, you know, has a couple, he has to summarize an entire conflict in a couple of sentences. And that's what you get. The best thing that, that we can do, the best thing that, 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 that you can do is actually, you know, go back and look into these things and read, read these things. One word that, you know, that we should keep repeating here is the word education. Because forget about prevention of genocides. Forget about anything close to preventing genocides and mass atrocities when you're not educated about these incidents. And that education does not even come from a panel like this. These are the experiences that are going to move you and push you to go back and read more about the Armenian genocide, the Cambodian genocide, the Rwandan genocide, the Holocaust, the, the, the horrors, the genocide in Serbia. So th that's, that is the take home message. And, and uh, again, there are always problems with the portrayal of uh, genocide and atrocities in movies, but that's, that's beyond the point. It's a take home message of doing something about what you hear. Uh, I recently visited Holland and uh, talked to uh, a, a woman who is a professor of history uh, in, at the university in Amsterdam. And she wrote a book about the history of education regarding what happened in the Netherlands during World War II, the Holocaust. In that book, she writes that the first 20, no, let me say this. The, uh, uh, in a small country like Holland, there were about 140,000 Jews, mostly in Amsterdam and some other places. For 20 years, the history that was taught in the schools in the Netherlands never mentioned anything about the persecution of Dutch Jews. 20 years. And then all of a sudden, there was nothing but history about the Holocaust and the Jews. So it was interesting to, to see that whatever the dynamics were, that no, they were not ready to have it in print or to teach history for 20 years about such an event as so many fellow citizens being, <coughs> being killed. So uh, it, uh, it gave me an interesting insight that uh, how education has to be sensitive or is sensitive, not has to be, is sensitive or not to certain aspects of history that are painful. I want to turn this over now to a member of the committee, Annie Lobel, to thank and close the, uh, the program. Wow, thank you. I want to thank our speakers for this incredibly special evening. I feel so fortunate to have been in the audience while you shared your stories with us. Bringing so many different experiences and cultures together in one form has been remarkable. And we have small gifts from the Tufts community to show how grateful we are for even sharing just snippets of your stories. So thank you there. Just gonna cast these down with our school colors, so I hope you like brown and blue. <laughs> Thank you to Rabbi Summit for being a fantastic moderator. Thank you to Judy Bond at, Face to, at Facing History and Ourselves for helping us get in contact with many of these fantastic speakers. I want to thank the Committee of Students in Tufts Against Genocide, where are you guys all around, <laughs> um, who put this event together, and Lauren Estes for going above and beyond her job um, in helping us with this event. So thank you so much. Seeing like-minded students care so much about a subject has been rewarding and, and inspiring. Thank you also to our co-sponsors, Tufts Hillel, Tufts Collaborative on Africa, and Stand for your, for your help as well. Thank you to William and Joyce Cummings for getting students excited about bringing this type of genocide education and programming to campus. 
If you are interested in seeing more genocide programming like this in the future at Tufts, we will have collection tables on our way out for the smallest donations. We are hoping to get 100% student involvement to show, in, to, to show student interest in taking action against genocide. Thank you, to, thank you to the audience, many of our friends and family, for coming to an event that means so much to me personally, as well as just so many of the people here. Please do take the time to take another look at the pamphlet and to read the incredible stories of the people sitting in front of you. I hope this evening, I hope this evening initiates further discussions about this critical subject. Anyone interested in getting involved with bringing future genocide educating, education programming to campus, please let any of us know. I hope this, me, this evening has been, as, has been, I hope this evening has been as powerful for you as it has been for me. I wish you all wonderful weekends and safe travels, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.